this is a video I've been meaning to make all year. Uh, it's gone quick. In fact, it's daylight savings morning here in Asuncion in Paraguay, which I did not realize. So I'm up an hour early and figured I guess, uh, I guess now is the time to do a video on the return of oracle systems amongst the serious practitioners uh, of magic, of cartomancy, and so on. Now, before we begin, let me just say I love tarot. I ride or die tarot. I'm going to be talking mostly about oracle card systems with some tarot in here, but I want to say at the outset that uh, I'm not Sophie's choice in <laughs> between my systems here, but there is something going on. There is something going on with the return to respectability and utility and discourse amongst serious practitioners of systems that are or have been previously derided. And we're going to start off talking about Fortune's Fools, talking about my Lenormand deck, which will not be linked up below because it is out of print. Uh, the, the print run uh, has been completed. Actually, you know what? I will link it up below because if you're interested, you can uh, sign up to be notified if slash when we do uh, a reprint. But obviously, over the last few years, working on something like Fortune's Fools, I have been thinking about what Oracle cards can do, the tarot cards can in the right hands, but aren't as good at, right? So if you think about different forms of transport, they're good for different things. You might want a large SUV or a truck of some description. If you live in the countryside, that's not great. If you live in the middle of an old European city that predates cars, then you want one of those um, tiny little ridiculous uh, uh, Italian numbers, right? So similarly, when we're talking about the language of cartomancy, some systems are better at other things than um, other systems. In the case of, let's say, uh, Lenormand, right? Not just Lenormand, but kind of anything in the Lenormand world. If you look at what the imagery uh, is and compare it to the tarot, it's quotidian, it's day-to-day, -day, it's little things. The, I, I like to joke all the time that it's a very botanical deck. So you've got the tree, you've got the lily, you've got the bouquet. There's all, lots of um, little day-to-day -day things. You have a ring, you have a letter. Um, there are just small moments uh, of day-to-day -day life, whereas in the tarot, you have the devil, you have the pope, you have a woman pretending to be the pope, which is where that card, the high priestess card originally comes from. It's very operatic, it's very cosmic, the wheel of fortune, death, and so on. There's a sort of death card, of course, in Lenormand, which is the coffin, but the coffin is, is a beautiful individual moment. Uh, it's uh, a widow standing beside the grave of her husband of, of 50 years. When it's death, <laughs> one of the four horsemen, you're in a much more operatic world. So one of the things that I think oracle systems, and not all oracle systems are created equal, let's be clear about that. But one of the things I think oracle systems can do really, really well is match to, see there's the child, um, is match to just the day-to-day -day life, the child, the house, a letter. Uh, there are some astrological components. So in the case of Lenormand, it overlaps with the star or stars, the moon and the sun, which of course, actually makes sense because um, astrology is a cosmic story, um, but it's also a beautiful individual little story. So that's the first thing that I would say decent oracle card systems uh, are good at. The second thing, and I borrow this from Donna Haraway, is responsibility. So picture that word response, ability, ability to respond. When you pick up, I mean, mine comes with a complete book of fortune telling, which I'm in fact very proud of. Uh, and the, the purpose of that book is to allow you to pick up any deck of cards and run with it. But some of the other ones we'll be looking at, uh, and in fact, we can move to it now. This is from Natalia Lee Forti from Haiti and Prince and Cyprian's deck of cards. There is a little white booklet inside of it, but the responsibility comes from Oracle card systems because they've been so derided. And, and some of that derision is frankly sexist, like, these are womanish 
19th century concerns. Who is my daughter going to marry? We have the ring card, the man, the, the wife. These are the, the, um, the issues of womanish concern, right? So it's been a bit, you can detect something in the undercurrent of the derision uh, that does not match 2024. Let's put it that way. So what you have with these cards with small little books or no books is complete freedom, complete responsibility. It doesn't have the weight of what I think of as um, silly is too strong a word, but entirely optional so-called meanings that have accrued, uh, accrued to the tarot from the late 1800s that certainly for beginners think is actually in there. This card means gossip. This card means quick decision. No, it doesn't. It's... It, uh, that's a more complex story than uh, it seems, right? You have no choice. <laughs> you have no choice when it comes to Oracle cards. It is responsibility right out of the tin. So I'm just going to give you a little look through of some of the cards in Natalia's St. Cyprian's deck of cards. And while we do that, I'm going to uh, give you my reason as to why you should care not specifically about these beautiful cards here, but about Oracle cards versus tarot uh, in the first place. Like you think, well, I already, I'm already pretty good at tarot. Why would, I, why would I jump to another system? Well, first of all, it's not, um, it's not either or, it's not a binary. But secondly, I would say absence makes the heart grow fonder. A necessary gap from anything um, builds a new perspective on a system that can otherwise become stale. So even if you merely holiday <laughs> in the world of oracles, that itself can boost your uh, tarot capacity. So the other thing, something like Lenormand has methods of, or, or systemic methods of communication between the cards, its versions of crosses, its versions of tableaus, and so on, and and the, the the dual combination of extracting a message out of the cards, that whilst they don't um, completely port over to tarot, learning those skills actually builds your capacity to uh, speak between the cards in a tarot system. So the first one, first reason to holiday inside something like uh, Oracle card systems is you get better at tarot and learn a new technique at the same time. The next reason I would say is if you are a bit of an archetypal explorer. And what I mean by that is it's a little bit unfair when dealing with something that's archetypally rich like fortune telling to talk about this stuff as if it's fads and fashions. Now, to some extent it is, but there's something else going on, right? So if you're a little bit interested in why it might be the case that the fortune-telling archetype more associated with uh, oracle card systems is closer to the surface, that, that wilder, woolier form than the, uh, the confident French um, operatic stability that you will get in so-called traditional uh, tarot card meanings. Like, why is that close to the surface? So if you're a little bit of an archetypal explorer, if you are interested in uh, what happens when you tangle with um, archetypes that are close to the surface of culture, then this is another reason to get yourself into oracle card town. You know, even as I just lay these out to have a look at, uh, Paraguay is a very good place to be discussing this deck in particular because it absolutely has a very uh, Latin, very Latin American vibe. When when I got these uh, early on in, very early on in the year, it might have actually been January 1 or a little bit after Christmas, I took them up to my uh, Brazilian cartomancy friend Avalon's house back in Tasmania. And I'll actually fla <laughs> flash a uh, image of that up because we sat at her kitchen table, day drinking beer and playing with the cards, and she said it was giving home country vibes. Uh, and why this deck, I think, is... Well, it's lovely. Obviously, the artwork is lovely, and, uh, and, and I like what it can do. I've been playing with this uh, myself, particularly here. But 
there's an amusing, to me anyway, Hadean loop in how these cards came to be. So, uh, and why this is amusing and synchronicitous now is I'm putting together the next Grimoire course for the premium membership and the joke, although this is just going to end up being what it's called, is the Jake edit uh, in the sense of Jake Stratton Kent. So the many discussions and, um, and explorations we had have been on my mind. And I remember when Jose Leitao's first Cyprian book came out with Hadian, uh, St. Cyprian, a sorcerer's treasure, I, rem I, f I think. And there's some Cyprianic cartomancy suggestions in there using playing cards. This was absolutely Jake's vibe. We were talking every day at the time. I had a job where I didn't have to work uh, and Jake was relaxing having finished Testament of uh, St. Cyprian the Mage. And he, the world lost him for like two and a half weeks of him just <laughs> playing with this, with this card system that became another Hadian uh, book or booklet, one of Jake's many booklets with Hadian called Cyprianic Cartomancy. And it's that that inspired uh, Natalia's understanding of the system, uh, which I'm going to be using, like these cards are going to be used and as an example of how Oracle systems can be incorporated with at least blue grimoire spirit work. So there's a fun circular Hadian Jake, Latin America, uh, Cyprian angle to uh, sharing these cards with you at this time. But yes, if you're keen, uh, Natalia Lee Forty's uh, San Cyprian stack of cards from Hadian. Uh, I absolutely, like my friend Avalon does, I absolutely vibe with the terroir uh, of this particular deck. Next cab off the rank from my old alma mater, my own uh, publisher, Scarlet Imprint, is Balthazar Black's Divine Gypsy Mother. And uh, this is definitely a deck after my own heart because, I mean, I did my own uh, 19th century fortune telling, de uh, telling deck tied specifically, I would say, to the, um, the spirit of Lenormand herself, who uh, my artist, uh, Colin Alexander, and I, I think, um, go to bat for as the actual tutelary being behind the Lenormand deck. Uh, if you read typical history, they'll say she had nothing to do with it. She lived her whole damn life out loud and built a reputation so strong that people's first thought after her death uh, was to name a system after her. So I think she's involved. And uh, as my friend Kristen said in, in the jungle during an Amazon dieta last year, she sounds exactly like the kind of woman who can arrange a, uh, a fortune telling deck after her own death. And that is absolutely right. Balthazar went in a uh, related but also different direction and with, I would say, similar philosophical goals. I don't want to say political, that's not right. Uh, which is to explore and celebrate the frankly true origin of uh, cartomancy inside Europe with the gypsies. And I feel, like, I feel like that word is allowed again now. It's come round and round. We would say traveler, Romani, Rom, and I think we're back at gypsy. Um, it, I certainly mean no offense by it, <laughs> but it's the same. It is a 36 uh, card deck and it comes with an incredible book, which I will tell you about in a moment. I don't have it with me because once again, in Paraguay traveling, uh, but I know oh, I'll tell you about it now. So I remember Balthazar Black's writing from uh, back in the, I guess, magic blogging 1.0 days. And it has his same very patient very uh, precise and, and diligent and comprehensive description of how and why you would use a system like this. So if you're vibing with the, um, the rise of Oracle cards and maybe uh, Natalia's more uh, freewheeling, here are my cards, good luck, don't call me <laughs> approach. If you're like, oh, do you have something in the middle, uh, I would suggest we go with Divine Gypsy Mother. Uh, and this is, oh, I mean, that's probably not one of them, is it? Uh, what? Does this have my number on it? No, uh, but limited edition of 525. Uh, run, don't walk <laughs> if, you want, <laughs> if you want this deck. Uh, so what I like here, in, and in particular in conjunction with the book, is I have learned where 
the uh, the gypsy ap approach, and even uh, because Balthazar Black lives in the Low Countries, uh, even that more almost Northern European uh, approach to a system like this overlaps and doesn't overlap with uh, the Lenormand. And I've learned a lot from it. There's actually, uh, there is a triple cross spread in the book, which is genius. Uh, I've, I've never seen it, I've never seen it done before. And I, I don't, I'm racist against significators. So it's a significator layout. Um, so I just remove the significators and, and still run the triple cross spread. And it's fantastic. So uh, honestly, that spread alone is, is worth the price of entry. The name of the deck uh, references the, dare I say, the archetype um, that um, Balthazar is celebrating, the, the divine gypsy mother, the, the, um, the countless women that threw cards like this and playing cards and whatever they could get uh, in service of the art and in service of swindling and in service of telling fortunes and facing fate and so on. And I really love the name. I really love the, uh, I really love the spirit in which this project was brought to the world. And it's a further example of why I, um, I think it's an easy case to make that the fortune telling approach, that archetype that is in fact archetypally something like the divine gypsy mother is, uh, is closer to the surface and is beckoning you for your own development and hers to engage. The final one I want to commend to you is in fact a tarot deck, um, which I haven't been buying much of, of late because I've been in fortune telling oracle card town. And I almost didn't with this one because I thought it was a bit gimmicky. Uh, but that's not the case. What actually tipped me over was you've got a Matthews uh, involved, John and Caitlin Matthews being um, the OG power couple uh, of Tarot. And if there's a Matthews name on it, you know it's going to be good. So I took the plunge and they showed up the day before I, uh, I was due to leave and I wasn't sure what Tarot deck to take with me. Very, uh, um, for more than a decade now, a Marseille of one form or another is like my home tarot deck. And this is Marseille, okay? Um, which is one of the other things uh, I liked about it. I think someone like John or Caitlin Matthews uh, has the uh, capacity to blend them in a way that remains true to their um, separate and individual particular talents. Now, there's a short history of tarot, I guess, going back the last six or seven years, which we might as well call the Kickstarter era, right? Like the peak of um, <laughs> uh, the, the peak of like a tulip mania uh, bubble. And we're coming out of that, which is merciful. And, and I had hoped as we were going through it, that we would end that bubble somewhere in Marseille town, which we did. Uh, it's just that it was it was kind of brief. And in fact, the best deck that I bought last year was Alejandro Rosan's Tarot des Ambiguité. And that's uh, a reimagining and a blending and a rewilding of the Marseille. And I was sharing that during the filming of the Foundations course. And that was my tarot deck for the second half of last year. And if you're in the mood or in the market for something in Marseille town, that's one for you. Let me talk you through the ideas behind the Tarot of Light and Shadows, who, the artist being Andrea Asti. And I'll be honest, the other reason, like I was interested in this because I love the art. Now, one of the other things I'm racist against is extra cards in the um, deck, but they can be forgiven in this. I will just take them out, right? So what you have here is a light and a dark deck. The art is identical, but reversed. Now, obviously, light and dark, as uh, John Matthews uh, goes to pains to tell you in the book, is not good and bad. And I've been really enjoying using this deck here in Latin America because, well, two things. Rather than light and dark, what you want to do with the dark deck is, uh, John writes in the book as, um, this gives you a different perspective on uh, a particular question. Uh, and I like that because I'm a perspectivist 
So it's halfway to animism. I'm in the middle of recording an animism series, as many of you know. So I like that description of it. For me, one of the other things that I would commend this deck to people for is shadow work. So uh, I typically ask the question, what am I not seeing about blah? And um, that's when I engage the dark deck. But why it's so good for, well, why the match to Latin America is very pleasing to me is the uh, Latin way of reading cards. And I've had my cards read a couple of times um, here is to, and I'll just, these are all, <laughs> these are all in order. So this isn't a reading, but you lay out a series of cards, typically five or six, just intuitively depending on which ones, uh, how many match the question at hand. And then you will either ask follow-up questions or clarifying questions, right? And so there might be, oh, I need to know more about this. And if, if the justice card is like, well, who's hidden? No, the hermit card. Well, who's hiding? Okay, or, or what's hiding here? And in that case, I would engage the, uh, the shadow deck, right? So um, to get clarification from the shadow for a kind of top-line question, if you have an elaborated or next question, you can jump back to the light cards uh, and so on. So there's a, there's a play between light and shadow, hence why it's called the Tarot of Light and Shadow, that I find really, um, really delightful here. So if you are in the market for uh, a tarot that is a match to this return of oracle cards amongst, I would say, serious practitioners, something like this, which on the outset looks like a gimmick, but is actually really good, is actually uh, really, really useful. And you can kind of tell this is tarish rather than tarot because uh, the way it is grappled with, wrestled with, engaged with, is more in the world of oracle cards. Now, of course, you could. You have two complete decks here. So, and they go to pains to mention this in the book as well. It's like, listen, you, have, you bought two tarot decks, so you can just read one of them. You can actually, because I would, like, let's let's be honest, like the, the shadow cards are very cool, right? I mean, I love the art in general. I, that was one of the reasons that I um, went in this direction, but the cards are lovely. Uh, so you actually have two completely normal <laughs> tarot decks you can take with you. But particularly when you are reading for yourself, that extra perspective, uh, one of the unlocks for uh, self-readings to get, to get outside of uh, the more typical cognitive uh, biases that we have is the what am I not seeing question. What am I lying to myself about? Uh, that's the stuff that a, an extra person is very, very useful for. And you have the closest thing you're going to get to an extra person in a double deck combination. So in the world of uh, a return of Oracle cards for serious practitioners, here is a deck that uh, you also, or double deck, uh, double decker, that you also may want to have a look at. So the short history of tarot, I guess, over the last five or six years is a manic horde of frumpy collectors cancelling each other and basically playing hyper-commercialism on the internet and doing very little actual fortune telling. The longer history of tarot, I think this is a big part of this moment, is also uh, up for re-engagement. And that's by way of a new uh, remarkable little book from Scarlet Imprint called Two Esoteric Tarots, which again, traveling, I didn't bring with me but uh, I made sure to uh, prove <laughs> that I have indeed read this book and found it really compelling. Like it has been sitting with me uh, this whole trip. I finished it before my uh, filming at Lake Mungo and the filming of the prayer course for premium members. And it's a dialogue with uh, Peter Mark Adams, who of course has been on the show uh, several times and is the author of A Game of Satin. And the premise of the book is the philosophical origins between the Sola Busca Tarot, or Sola Busca, and the Marseille are shared. And those shared philosophical origins are the straight up Platonic religion, simply, uh, amongst in particular the European elite uh, of the Renaissance that was brought about by the arrival of Gemisto Plethon. 
I won't say more about it uh, than that, uh, except to say that one of the reasons perhaps that it's been sitting in my head is that something Jake and I um, spoke about uh, at length, which obviously is on my mind right now, is the um, what he called the low Platonism, uh, particularly of the Hellenistic and, and, and Greek world, rather than the high Platonism we have here. There's a, a crypto Platonism that is plainly obvious uh, to me now that I've read this book in the Marseille. Uh, I already knew it from a game of Saturn um, in uh, the Solar Busker. And so I'm not going to say more than that, because if that's alive for you, it's worth reading the dialogue uh, that's actually in the book. But the other thing they did, and I, I think this is useful, is pinpoint where we got the idea that there isn't a uh, esoteric, dare we say, magical purpose behind the tarot. And that's in a 20th century uh, book by some historians of playing cards called A Wicked Deck of Cards. Uh, a wicked pack of cards, sorry. And it's what happens when you get materialists doing history. We know this. We know this is a thing that uh, happens in the history of magic. And it was this general declaration that it was just those 18th century Frenchies who invented uh, the esoteric associations with magic. Now, if that idea of the two esoteric tarots, um, I think, you never really prove things with history, but I think making an, a, a fairly unassailable case that uh, the, the tarot and both the Marseille and the Solar Busker, and thus even the humble Smith Waite uh, has uh, earlier esoteric origins. If that's alive to you, grab that book. And I would also suggest you can do um, either or of the following things. Do the tarot course in the premium members area. You get all the courses for 12 bucks a month. So you can grab that one and the foundations and the Grimoire course that's coming. And or also read Peter Mark Adams' A Game of Saturn. And also, here comes a, another Matthews, Caitlin Matthews' Untold Tarot, which doesn't delve into the same area historically, but certainly does look at how the cards conveyed uh, Christian virtues, and uh, which is a modification of Platonic ideas anyway. You read all of them together and or do the tarot course and... The case is, is pretty good, and that invites you to sit with what even am cards? What's going on here? And I think that haunting, that uh, queering of, of tarot history is part of the arrival, uh, archetypal arrival of the divine gypsy mother, of this being, of this, this uh, fortune-telling form that invites us to uh, dance in a, a new and ancient way. Uh, to, to rediscover that which should never have been taken from you, uh, which is this, uh, this approach to reading cards. And it's that thing which seems to be uh, building and bubbling underneath not just uh, the oracle card world, but even the tiny fraction of the tarot community that I can take even slightly seriously as a magical practitioner. So... Something is going on here, and a, a word that we might want to use for it is a rewilding, uh, an and uncovery of that um, atavistic, uh, archetypal, uh, free form that I think is, is the best match to the conditions that we're about to head through, which is my ulterior motive for putting this video together. We are not heading into, slash we are not living in, a world of predictable meanings. Uh, a world of, of mapping the Smith weight to the decans and uh, little Hebrew letters and all the rest of it. That's not our world. Um, our world is one known better to the gypsies. Uh, it's, it's precarious, it's dangerous, and it requires a more oracular, hence oracle, uh, mode of engagement. And that's being done two ways. That's being done by the, the breaking of the more recent materialist stranglehold on the, on the history of cards, uh, which has happened to magic as well, uh, but is happening to cards now. And also, which is what the Divine Gypsy Mother can do, which is what this archetype can do, a, uh, a unshackling of the, uh, the stricter rules that we got from those 18th century Frenchmen. So if you're feeling the call, 
any of these decks, really. Uh, Fortune's Fools, the Supreme's Deck of Cards, Divine Gypsy Mother, the Tarot of Light and Shadow are a great place to dive in.